Ricky here. Before we get into today's episode, I have an announcement for Chicago-based listeners. I am having a show of my latest oil paintings at the Andersonville Galleria in the Andersonville neighborhood of Chicago for the month of April. So I hope to see you at the opening reception on Saturday, April 6th from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. And for more details, you can go to rickyartist.com. With that, let's get going with this week's episode. On this episode of Eager to Know, why drawing the human figure is so important and the value of starting fresh. We all have a creative part of our brain, whether we use it or not, for generating new ideas, problem solving, and just viewing ourselves in this world. I am Ricky McGeckron, an artist living in Chicago, and I am eager to know and share with you all how people of a creative leaning have brought this way of thinking to the forefront and how it has shifted outcomes. Originally from Anchorage, Alaska, Eric Elliott is an oil painter and assistant professor of painting at Colorado Mesa University. We spoke about his love of comic books as a child and his artistic journey up to now. A small programming note, the audio on this episode sounds a bit different than usual because it was not recorded in my usual studio. So when you were a kid, I'm assuming that you were the artsy kid, is that... Is that correct? I know you grew up in Anchorage, which is a, a pretty decent sized city. Um, and you did you go to public school? Yeah, I went to public school. I would say, I mean, th- there isn't a whole lot of art in uh, Anchorage. There's at the, uh, the main museum, it's more historical. And so any kind of art you would see is landscape paintings of Mount McKinley or anything like that. So. I I really wasn't so much inspired by the quote-unquote arts, but more by comic books. Um, The the way in was that I just always drew, since as long as I can remember, I've been drawing. And so drawing comic books or looking at comic books or anything like that, when I was a kid, that's what I thought I wanted to do. Is be a comic book artist? Yeah, and then as I got older, I realized I really didn't enjoy drawing the same thing over and over again. Um, I wasn't very good at that, so then... I wasn't sure exactly what, what I What do you mean drawing the same thing over and over again? Well, just like, so if you do a comic book, you have the same character that you're gotcha. then turning to the left, turning to the right, making them smile. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So first I went to school for graphic design. Um, but then I, I realized quickly, well, or not so quickly, um, that I wasn't the type of person to do what somebody else wanted me to do. Sure. Um, so like I can relate to that. Be given being given a project of make a logo based on this. That just wasn't my personality. And so it was kind of like I broke it down into uh, graphic designers are, are, are good people like almost like um, like you're given a, a puzzle and you're you're able to solve that puzzle in a way. It's almost like an art challenge. Um, okay. Versus I was more somebody that was trying to get out something that was inside me, like trying to express something. And so if, you know, if there was some other thing, it didn't work, didn't mesh with with whatever I felt like it was that I was needing to do, the the thing that was compelling me to make work. So so did you feel that when you were a little kid, that there was something inside that you were, um, so obviously you had this skill that you were developing by doing comic books, but did you feel like there was something that was trying to you were trying to get outside? I mean, drawing? obviously, I don't think I thought of it that way. Yeah. But, but it was more like trying to create my own world, or you know, trying to create these characters or, or scenes. And so, most of my drawings um, would be just start as like a kind of scribbling a bunch of lines down and see how those lines created a character. Or um, and so, I mean, ultimately, that was. Since comic books were all I really knew, that was kind of how would they, that's how they would evolve in a sense, the, the, the drawings. And um, so were comic books your, so it sounds like comic books was your first exposure to art. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, there's always art around, like the stuff that's on the walls in people's houses. Yeah. And then I remember as a kid going to, uh, like the Smithsonian National Museum in, in DC, and, yeah. and I just remember I wasn't really that excited by the artwork I saw there because 
I think at a young age, you're used to pop culture, and if, if, if work of art isn't easily accessible, then it's not, I don't know, maybe you don't fully understand yeah. why you should care about the street scene or something like yeah. that. Um, and so I think a lot of that beauty kind of um, comes to you with knowledge. Like the more you learn about art, the more you delve down that rabbit hole, the more those things open up to you in a way. Okay. Yeah. So there's kind of two sides of it. So there was sort of like, there was this, the side of you creating something, but then there was the side of observing mm. and appreciation, mm. which it sounds like that part didn't happen until you were, uh, you know, older and more evolved. And I would say that's even an evolution. Um, so basically I was in graphic design school and I decided to go try and take a painting class. So I went to the community college teacher and was like, I've been drawing my whole life and I really want to learn how to paint. Oh, so uh, you hadn't painted before. Oh. No, I was probably 19 and I and when I did this and so I went to the teacher and she said, just let me see your sketchbook. Um, so I showed her, showed her my sketchbook and she let me into her painting class without having the prerequisites and okay. um, you know, I made a bunch of horrible paintings, but I fell in love with paint, like just the malleability of it, the way it... Uh, the was it oil? Moves. Yeah, oil yeah, paint. Yeah, and, it was uh, the best. <laughs> and, um, and that was just it. Then I was just uh, hooked. And so I, you were hooked immediately. Yeah, and I, so I basically, I, I, I had a semester left to do graphic design, so I finished up my graphic design degree, but it, I just kept continuing taking community college classes for a couple of years. Um, in Arizona before I finally decided to go back to school for fine art. So when you discovered oils, how did that change what you were creating? Because mm -hmm. obviously I'm sure you had a, you had some sort of subject matter that you were um, expressing with drawing. Um, would that, did that change now that you had access to all of this other stuff? Colors, textures, etc.? Yeah. I Hmm. So, I mean, I think a big part of it was at, at that community college, I also started taking some figure drawing classes, and it was this huge um, realization on how much I didn't know, and so... Well, figure drawing will do that. Yeah, <laughs> that is for sure. And so, but also, what the beauty of your first figure drawing class is you have an ex exponential amount of growth. Yeah. Like, you can see the difference in one semester and so it was one of those things where it was like intoxicating of like, oh my gosh, I thought I could draw, but I knew nothing. And like just realizing now I know something and, I st and I, now I realize how far you are at the bottom, like how far knowledge is above my head and how much further I had to go. Yeah. And so for me, that was also kind of exciting with like all of this stuff to learn. And there, there, was, there was much more to grow that you hadn't even realized. So you probably, you know, it yeah. sounds like you thought that you were this, and then once you started figure drawing, you realize mm -hmm. I'm not that. Like, well, and it's one thing like being the art kid in your high school, and there aren't a few that many, you know, kids that can draw. And I wasn't the best one, but I was one of the kids that drew all the time. And so it's like I just imagine like I didn't go to an art school, but that, you know, what, that an art school is all those kids that were that art kid at their school, and they yeah. thought they were the best, and yeah. then all of a sudden they get to art school, and they're like, oh my god, everyone's better than me, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but I, yeah, yeah, I definitely hear that. I mean, I didn't go to art school, mm -hmm. but I hear that. But I also heard the same thing from what, one of my good friends. He went to MIT, mm -hmm. and um, it was kind of the same experience for him. He was always the smarty pants all through school up until high school, and then he graduated, and when he went to MIT, everyone there, they were all smarty pants. <laughs> so now, like, the, exactly. the game, the, everything changed. So one thing I just want to mention about figure drawing, because a lot, of, a lot of people listening, most people listening to this aren't familiar with, you know, what we're talking about, how challenging that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, figure drawing is, um, it's so important to learn as a, an artist to draw because you don't have to be an artist to tell that a figure is off. Mm. You know, I mean, and that's why it's great for, you, you don't have to be, you don't have any experience at all and you can tell that a figure's proportions or whatever is just the slightest bit off. Now, if you're doing a landscape, 
you can't tell that. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're um, the accuracy between what you're observing with your eyes and what you're putting down on the canvas, if that's off by a little bit, it's not going to register. Mm -hmm. And and when you're yeah, and when you're doing a figure drawing, you you don't need a, a teacher for it to register, and so you can tell. So it's a great tool um, for de for developing. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say yeah, that's uh, um, and I think that's one of the hardest part for students that want to go into figure is that even the, the person off the street will come in and be like, oh, that, that arm is a little off. Mm -hmm. and, and it becomes so discouraging because you spend so much time and you put so much effort in. And um, for me, I actually started doing figure. So I you know, came in with co comic books creating these characters. And so I got into figure drawing, was really excited. But to me, actually, what became more exciting was the painting process and learning about painting and how you could express yourself kind of through painting. But I still... I, I wanted to have something in it, so it's like I wanted the figure, I wanted something. But then I just got so discouraged because people got caught up on the figure in this way, and, and I was like, the figure didn't, isn't the thing. Right. And so I actually got rid of the figure and started painting more still life and interiors and things yep. like that. But um, yeah, it, the figure drawing is great because you can learn so much and actually see your progress and really... It, yeah, it's it's a great learning tool. And you can see you can see your growth. It reminds me of like yoga because yoga is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you do yoga, but yoga is something where it's there. It's an unlimited amount of growth because mm -hmm. you're you never master it, and you can always just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And I mean, really, all of creative endeavors are kind of like that. But with re, you know, kind of like yoga, it's you're, there's always there's always room to get better. Well, that's it's the funny thing <coughs> with. Um, with art in that way because so I got my masters in, in painting and drawing and then um, at a certain point I decided I wanted to learn I, I was I was creating these paintings and it was going fine but I was I felt like I was kept making the same painting mm -hmm. in a way like I wanted to do something very different and I was trying to reinvent myself but I just couldn't seem to do it so I actually created my own um, kind of Kickstarter artist residency to go and study at the school in Jerusalem, Israel, to kind of reinvent myself. Um, and it was like, I'm going to go back to school to learn this new way of painting. And people kept being to me or asking me, "Don't you already have your masters?" Yeah. Like, and I, I just, I just didn't. I was, how does that have anything to do with my? You know, it's like you're you're constantly learning. I don't know. It's just crazy to me that people think, "Oh, you have your masters. You know everything." Yeah, <laughs> that, that does seem like that. Well, I can see how people would think that. So, yeah. so this it was a residency. Yeah. So basically, it's it's a kind of a four year school, um, in in the sense that it's um, trying to think how to explain it because the school there they hate the idea of the atelier schools, but it's like that where you start with kind of drawing and painting and yep. work your way up, um, getting more skilled. But in it, you're kind of developing. Um, your kind of perspective and lens and the way you see the world but it's all observational based but so I just went in um, as a first year kind of and just immersed myself as a new student and wanted to learn the way that that, that it was being taught there and so um, so it was really kind of this fun but humbling experience of coming in and trying to learn a completely different way of, of painting I mean I've been painting at that point for I can't remember exactly probably like 15 20 years or something and and then you go in and try and pretend like all that knowledge you already have doesn't exist okay and be a beginner again and just and it was actually difficult um, because so the, the the teacher there is Israel Hirschberg his, his perspective it's much more about um, seeing the abstraction that's in the world like so as opposed to, to naming the objects you're seeing the abstraction that makes up the world in a sense okay and it's one of those things that i teach seeing shapes and abstraction and color and bringing it together sure but i i feel like in the past i was still thinking of it in terms of the shapes that make the object and in here you are completely getting rid of all knowledge in a sense and trying to see the world as if you are just seeing it abstractly. So did they have to break you down and mm -hmm. rebuild you up to do that? Or did they just start right out of the gate that this is how you're going to, this is how we're going to convey painting to you? I mean, so yeah, it's just, this is, we're, we're going to teach it this way and you're going to, we're going to 
say whether you're doing it that way or not. You know, oh, okay. So, so this is how you think about observe when you observe something. Yeah. This is how you're going to process it, mm -hmm. and we will just keep checking in to see if you are. It's like you make a mark, and they're like that. That mark's not working. You, you, you're not thinking correctly. You need to see, look at the object. You're not looking at the object. You're, you're thinking about the object in a sense. It's okay. Like, so it's like um, you was maybe that, look at a shape, and you instead of like normally we just see like this cut out shape but it's like you're analyzing it for its color its dimensions its location it's like there's so many aspects to that shape the individual character of that shape but how do you then do you express that with a charcoal line so it's it's kind of this like yes you're trying to say describe exactly what you're seeing but there's also a translation going on yeah, because completely. you're translating into the medium mm -hmm. so then it's like what is the best way to communicate that and that can be at you know, it can be a smear, a smudge, a rub, uh, and so... So that sounds like that could have been not always enjoyable if you had all of this, these years of producing work that, you know, you somewhat felt good about and you felt confident about, and now you're going into a situation where they're telling you, no, that's wrong. And it probably took you a while to get to a point where they're saying, yes, that's right. So was that, were you ever like, oh my God, this is awful, I'm leaving? Yeah, I'm trying to think if they ever said yes, that's right. <laughs> um, it was, no, it was one of those things, like I said, it, it seems very straightforward. You, you, you're you going to look at the world in terms of abstraction, like that's an easy thing to say. But then when all of a sudden you're, you're supposed to apply it, and that's, the, that's, that's art in a nutshell. It's like I can tell you that painting is just getting your shapes right, Getting your color right and getting your edges right—that's all. That's all painting is, and and then all of a sudden you try and go apply that, and it takes years. Um, but basically, yeah, it was it was like, it's one of those things where you're like, I know I'm supposed to be doing this, but my brain won't let me. So it's like having to rewire your brain because you've been doing it for so long that it you know it's like if you were to if you're right-handed and then you try and go brush your teeth with your left hand, you have to. Go, you have to go rewire your brain to learn yeah. how to do it. But uh, I think the other thing um, was that through all my schooling, I was taught a certain way to paint. So it's like you do your your base drawing, you get your whole composition in, then you start blocking in your large colors, and then they didn't do it that way. It was like you put a mark down, and that mark should be right from the first. So then the second mark is correct. and the, So every mark builds on each other. I and mean, if, if the mark's not right, you scrape it off and you try it again. Um, okay. And so it was very a very different way than yeah. the way I was taught also. I'm not saying which is right and which is wrong, but when you're trying to come at it as a new person, like trying to get rid of your previous knowledge, um, it's hard. But then now, as I come back, then I try to simulate those things into one body of knowledge. So, so, would, you s so would you say that um, in your painting now, are you using that same approach? Or are you using, um, or, uh, is that inform your approach now a little bit? I So with my painting, one of the things I feel like, you know, the challenges of being a painter is coming up with your, your voice, your idea, your thing that you're trying to bring to the world. Or, and then you're also thinking about, like, I'm trying to make a masterpiece in a sense. There's like these two things that you're you're challenging yourself with. And for me, a, a big part was of being an artist was trying to find that vision. And um, so like I said, I went off to this uh, residency to try it because I wanted to change things up. And so it's an interesting way of, okay, if I'm painting totally differently, how is what's important to me still coming forward in this new way of painting? And that could be true, like say you have a specific vision and then someone tells you, okay, now you need to do that vision in sculpture. Like, what would you do? It's, it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's a more subtle step to go from a different method of painting. So to me, actually, what I've been, since I got back, it was like this process of trying to digest what I've been learning and figure out my way of doing it. But in that process, I realized that I didn't want to have one way. Okay. If that makes sense. So now I actually... So that, that's one of the key learnings from that experience. Exactly. And so what I've actually started doing is I paint the same still life multiple ways right now. That's the current kind of direction that I'm doing. So I'll set up a still life and I'll paint it from observation. And then I'll say, okay, 
how could I convey the same idea a little differently? And okay. so I'll do the same painting. Or maybe while I'm painting it, I'm thinking about, I really wish I abstracted this more, I dissolved it more. So I'll just start a new painting. Rather than you know, trying to do all these different versions in one painting, yep. I've now started painting multiple versions. So my latest series, I did 20 versions of the exact same blue cup still life. That okay. are, some are almost, you know, realism and some are like almost pixelated abstraction um, and it's just like how do I convey an idea how do I communicate an idea is it clearer to the viewer if I explain the same thing in multiple ways or is it clear to the viewer if I try and do the same thing in the exact same way every time and I'm sure there's merits to both but for me it's been the freedom to do whatever I want and that's like it's like for me sometimes the studio becomes work and yeah. I don't want that. Like, I want the studio to be fun. There's a reason I became an artist, and it's not to, to feel like it's my day job. Or, you know, it's, I want to have fun in the studio. And so to me, if I can reinvent that still life, or if I can play with it, or if I can push it, or, I, you know, there's no reason that I can't do it another way. I remember hearing, I, I want to say it was Kandinsky, that once he'd gone completely abstraction, or into the, uh, to the realm of abstraction, that he, he said... He he wanted to just paint a blue horse and he wasn't allowed to anymore. Or something, you know. I don't remember who it was exactly Kandinsky, but it's that idea of not wanting to get pigeonholed. Um, and then someone says, "Oh, you're the person that does this," right. and so then you're not allowed to do a realist painting. Right. So it's like I I I because I was like delving down this rabbit hole of kind of you know quasi photo realist painting, and I didn't want someone to tell me I couldn't do that. Yeah. Because I want to learn. I want to, as a painter, I want to grow. I want to be able to take it in whatever direction I can. So now you're rebelling by doing 20 versions of a blue cup. Exactly. Very much rebelling. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and then so what's also fun is then of doing these different processes, you start to say, oh, this is really interesting about this specific direction. And then you can delve into that rabbit hole and explore it without feeling like you're trapping yourself and in, in once again being like, am I going to be able to commit to this direction? Is this my new direction? I'm like, I can do it for one painting, I can do it for 20 paintings. Yeah. And then I can change gears because I've given myself that freedom. Yep. So would you say that the way that you are, like these, these, 20, these 20 paintings that you're doing and thinking about things and executing things in different ways, would you say that that informs the way you think about areas outside the studio in your life? Wow. Because um. I know that, you know, when I started painting and, and drawing, I, I know that um, it definitely, af it certainly in changed the way I viewed the world visually, mm -hmm. you know, because now I started seeing things in terms of not objects, but like shapes and values and things of that nature. Um, but sometimes I would say that it sort of changes the way I view um, relationships between different things. Because, you know, a lot of painting is, is about differences, mm -hmm. you know, like relativity of value and things of that nature. And I definitely, it changes the way, a little bit, the way I see things in my life. It, it, well, so, I mean, I definitely can say it's changed the way I look at other artwork. Okay. Um, because once I, so, so I should probably do one step back, is, is for me, um, I've been, like my message that I'm trying to communicate, I guess, is like wanting to say that the world is bigger than just the individual. So if I'm painting a thing, I'm wanting to show how it's interconnected with the rest of the painting itself. So it's like talking about interconnections. So the object isn't just an object, the object is part of something larger. So to me, it's like connecting the figure to the ground, connecting the person, the figure, the object to the environment, to the space. And so in that, I'm talking about um, the world, whether it be spiritually, whether it be just scientifically, the fact that we are not individual things, we are part of some larger whole, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. Okay. Every, everything is everything is more connected than we um, uh, than we th normally would think think about. So, so in the paintings, that's the idea. So when I'm thinking about doing 20 cups, I'm thinking about, okay, 
how can I paint but convey that same message? So either it's like I'm thinking about shapes interconnecting to make a larger whole like a puzzle, or I'm thinking about the marks baking up something bigger, or I'm dissolving space, dissolving edges so, so the form actually dissolves into the larger whole. So to me that's the idea um, of wanting to speak about this kind of in a larger idea. So then now when I'm looking at other paintings, I'm thinking about a lot, a lot more about how is the mark that they're making communicating something? So in a sense that like, could what they're doing communicate this bigger idea or, or just thinking about it on that individual level of, of how is the way that they're marking, putting things on the paint, communicating something a lot bigger, as opposed to just thinking about, I don't know, the, the colors or the, the aesthetic value of it or something. I'm thinking about it in, in this kind of way of like, could I appropriate that? Um, so I'm really kind of thinking about just individual pieces, parts of a particular work and like, could I, th that's an interesting thing that they've done there. Yeah. Um, but as far as like the larger whole of my life, and it's a really interesting idea of like thinking about, there's not necessarily one way to do things or thinking things in, and I haven't gone there yet, but I really like, it. we could delve down that rabbit hole, it'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, because I know when, so the example that I give, and this sounds like really weird, but I didn't fully appreciate the connection of like drawing to painting until I you know, went to the Florence Academy of Art and told you that. And the way that they taught us was everything starts with drawing and then you know, we would draw it with you know, blocks of single value, which leads itself right into painting you know, shapes of single value. Mm. And so I fully, and then being in Florence, you know, everything there is um, drawing, painting, and sculpture. Right. Like the Trinity. Like it's everywhere. And I never really appreciated how those three related. Yeah, yeah. Until, I know that sounds crazy, but I didn't until I got there. And then like, okay, these are all kind of three sides of the same three-sided coin. Right, right. Um, and I, that kind of made me think about other things. It kind of rewired my brain a little bit about... So an example that I give is when I go to... The, I'm a big workout guy. And um, so it made me see the connection between uh, stretching and lifting weights and running. Mm. And they're all kind of the same thing. Like, because everyone tries to forget about uh, about stretching. And it's kind of like, yeah, I'm going to paint, but I'm not going to do a sketch or a drawing. And I'm like, no, it's all the same thing. Like, the stretching is the foundation to the whole workout. And then, you know, the work uh, the weights is another part, and the running is another part. So now I think about, because of, you know, thinking about drawing, painting, and sculpture, I think about my workouts in this different way, which is really kind of surprising and odd, but I do. I think of it all as the same thing. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely think in terms of that with, um, it changed the way I think about my process in the sense that the idea is much more related to how I'm painting now. If that, it's like, I don't know, it's like... What do you mean? Well, in the sense that like, I'm not just going to go paint in this one style because it's different. Like I'm not just trying to practice painting in different styles. I'm trying to communicate an idea. So it's like, it's thinking more about how can I convey a message much more in a way than like necessarily trying to master one ability or one technical skill or find that one way of painting, which is, is Eric Elliott. It's like, it's, um, so are you trying to do 20 different, is it 20 different messages or is it one message that is expressed by this mosaic of 20 paintings? Hmm. I mean, I think there's, there's two ways that I come at it. It's one, am I, am I saying the message still? And then two, is it different than the previous painting? So there's some paintings that are very close to each other because, um, like, say I'm, I'm, a, I have a horrible time at like letting myself loosen up. It's very easy for me to tighten up, um, but it's very hard for me to loosen up in terms of my, my painter, painterliness. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'll be like, okay, now I'm going to try and be looser again because yeah. that one didn't go as far as I wanted. So then I'll do another one. And then what's great about it is I can hang them next to each other and be like, is this one actually different? And if not, then I'm going to keep working on it. Um, and so some of <laughs> it's hilarious to me. It's like they, they almost are exactly the same, but they're, 
such different intent or something, you know, or I, right. I, it's like, I pushed this one so much further. And it's like, eh, maybe, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, but it is trying to have this kind of gauge. Whereas before you would, you would try and paint loose and it's like, I could compare it to another painting, but it's a totally different painting. But when I'm comparing it to the exact same subject, the exact same colors and everything, I can really be like, is this actually different than the other painting? Um, am I actually pushing myself further? Um, it it kind of gives you uh, an interesting new way to kind of gauge how you're, um, how far you're taking that idea or how far you're really doing it. And so I don't know if that actually answered your question at all. Um, yeah, no, it does. So you, we had spoken before we started the podcast about how you were a little bit, I don't know if you use the word shy, but I think that you're in, introverted. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming that as a kid, you know, art was probably a source of like comfort if you were kind of read like a solitary kid and used art as a way to, um, you know, comfort you. I'm, I'm, am I assuming that? Um, I, I mean, I don't know if comfort's the right word, but yeah. I would definitely say attention um, because, you know, being an introverted kid, you can go sit in the corner and draw in a sketchbook and then people will come over and be like, oh, that's a cool drawing um, or, you know, it's it's kind of a way to connect with other people. Yes. Um, I mean, also, my dad was an engineer, so there, so in his office there was always be the drafting table that had the pencils and the big rulers on it. So there was lots of paper and pencils around. So uh, I could go into his office and just have these big papers and draw and do whatever. And it was a great way that I, you know, I could keep myself distracted. I think my dad worked a lot, so my brother became a musician and I became a, a artist in the way to like. I don't know, to keep ourselves <laughs> entertained wow. in that way. Well, that's a healthy um, that's a healthy way to do it. Yeah, and so, so for me, I think that was the start of it. Maybe of, uh, yeah, it was a way that I could do something that that then people could respond to. Is like if you're sitting in a corner and you read a book. Yeah. What are you gonna go to have a book club? It was yeah. yeah. It was a, it was a way <laughs> to. It sounds like a way to set you apart and to get a connection with people. Yeah, I, th I think so. that's a fair way to uh, think of it as a kid is, I mean, you obviously you're not consciously thinking about that, but then... Looking back on it, you're realizing. Yeah. So do you think that that is something... Because people, people had always said, this is crap, you would have quit doing it. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so I, I assume you probably are on the introvert still, and you know, you're still on the introverted side because that's something that's pretty much hardwired with you. Would you say that um, art is still a way for you to connect with others? Do you think you use it on some level in the same way that you used it as a kid? Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I definitely think as I get older, I, I'm less introverted, or I'm, I should say I'm more comfortable, because it, when you're a kid, you're, you get, you're scared to talk to people because you're afraid, uh, I don't know, who knows what you're afraid of, but as you get older, you've had, talked to enough people to realize that it's not that big a deal. Um, but also, it's, it's kind of the idea of under pressure, what do you say to people? I don't know. Like, it's, so it's like how to open that conversation and get that conversation going is gets easier as you go, get older, but... Um, as, as I got older, I think there's a certain level of addiction in art that sets in. So for me, it's like even if I didn't s become, have an art-related job, which I do, um, I would still be the Sunday painter, I would still be making art because it's become such a part of me and how I kind of express myself. And I, I think it's a big part of it is as I got older, I'd have friends that didn't have hobbies, and I was just like, well, what is the meaning in your life? You go to your horrible job, you, I mean, because this is when you're a kid and you have a job waiting tables or something like that. Right. It's like, you know, I'd be just like, you go, you go to this job and then you come home and you watch TV and maybe you go take classes for at school, but you don't know what you want to be when you grow up. So I was just like, art seemed like a thing bigger than myself that I could be a part of. You know, it's kind of, um, I think we all want some larger connection to something bigger than ourselves. And sure. so art, as you get, like in the beginning, it's just, I'm getting stuff out of me. And then later it becomes like, I am getting something out. It's like, there's something inside you that you can't express necessarily with words, unless you're a good poet or 
writer and so it's like it's almost like this unconscious something in the background in your brain that you're communicating with as an artist and trying to get that thing out there and so it's like it's almost like you're communicating with something that doesn't have language in your brain and you're trying to get that out and so the best way to do that is in something that doesn't have words that makes that makes total sense to me yeah so, so if there was an apocalypse and <laughs> you were left with nothing but art supplies, yeah. so there was no one to share your art with, I mean, would you still be producing the same amount? Of, I'm assuming that you weren't depressed because you're the only one here, but you know what I mean. Like, how much of it is just expressing something inside of you, and how much of it is sharing that expression with others and seeing their reaction and connecting with them? Yeah, that's interesting. Because, I mean, I... I I have thought of this, um, like because you think about there's an apocalypse. To me, I, with all these shows that are out now, um, I don't I don't think I would continue creating artwork because I'd be so like busy looking over my shoulder um, for zombies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, I guess it depends because I do think about like early man. They they would go hunting. And then they would maybe sow some seeds and they would go collecting. But a lot of the time they got to hang out and lounge around. Like in the winter, you, you know, you, I think they had a lot more downtime. So it's like, do I have more free time? Then yeah, definitely I'm going to be making something. But what that is, I don't know how, how that expression would come forward because to me there's a certain level. That, so, so one thing I feel like is hard for me as an artist is making something that takes up space in the world. I don't like how do I explain this? It's like I'm I, I guess I'm a minimalist in the sense that I don't really like the unnecessary um uh I don't need to buy a bunch of stuff to make myself happy. Like just a minimal amount. I need a good laptop, a good phone. Yeah. <laughs> um you know like but it's like but then so you're producing this thing that only for the most part wealthy people can buy and it's taking up space in the world it's like my personality is like i wish that i could be a poet where i could just have a sketchbook and i could sit down and write and i don't know it, it seems like this almost like selfish endeavor of creating these things that fill up and take up space in the world so you want to make sure that they have value that's a good way of putting it yeah, yeah. to think about that yeah but um in, in the terms of like, say this future apocalypse place, would me making a painting be the best use of my time to make the world a better place? Whereas now, I mean, some people would say it's bad that there's tons of artists in the world, but I would say like, isn't it amazing that we live in a time when so many people can be artists? Yeah. Like what does that say about our moment in history that there are so many artists and so many people trying to express themselves in a way and and what is that urge and what is it that people are trying to get out and I think that's it's a beautiful thing and it's obviously hopefully going to be able to change the world in a, a better place better direction yeah no I think it is a beautiful thing I think it, ha it it's good that we have a society that people are able to access that part of them um, I mean it's also hard right now because I feel like people don't value the arts as much as they used to I feel like there's become a much more acceptance of people to use pop culture as their as their expressive outlet so yeah. um like we're falling back into spending our free time on netflix and i'm guilty of this myself you yeah. know watching episodes and talking about the episodes we're seeing and it's as opposed to going out and going to art and reading books and talking about books i mean i think the nice thing is TV seems to be getting a hell of a lot better. That's, so I don't watch it. artistically, but I don't watch it. But I've heard that it's really good. It's getting That's, it's getting a hell of a lot better. I mean, I think it's becoming a, an amazing art form and has a lot of potential. But but it is kind of one of those scary things where you have. I, I, I lived in Seattle and we had a huge population of tech text people from Amazon and everything, and they didn't buy art. Right. Like I mean, I think they would probably rather go buy it a sell from an animation then they would go to a gallery and buy a painting. Right. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure there was some that maybe as they get older, they, they do. <laughs> but I feel like that's probably going to change because I think this sort of relates to, like, the 
uh, things being more homegrown mm -hmm. and people people appreciate because things have sort of tipped towards this mass-produced Walmart, Starbucks, like I love Starbucks, but mm -hmm. Starbucks, all of these like big brand, big box stores, everything is mass produced. And now like you see it with like craft beer. And I, I think that people, and even, even like used clothing, like that's mm -hmm. become like the big thing that people do. And I think people are more appreciative of stuff that's a little bit more thoughtful and real. I think or, or at least it has the appearance of being it. And hopefully that will catch on with uh, with artwork, be you know, because people buy, you know, I see stuff that people have in their homes for artwork and people that even don't have any money. And I so much appreciate when they have something that was in created by an individual mm -hmm. as opposed to buying or, e or a piece of furniture that was created by an individual as opposed to buying stuff from Ikea. And well, I, I think there's a hunger for authenticity. Yeah. And I think you're, you're, you're spot on. And I think that the hard thing is is that the um, the marketers have realized this too. So like you're saying, it's like the 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 all the big name beer band brands are buying the the small like Goose Island. Yeah, buying the small. It's like it's Anheuser Busch <laughs> or whatever. And then, and then marketing as a yeah. as a microbrewery, and so it's like, will people be willing to go out and spend a little extra on that authentic piece versus buying the you know the old navy version of it for three dollars because it's you know you go to you go to a street fair and you see someone selling knitted hats and it's fifty dollars for a knitted hat and then you figure out that you know that person if if they break it down that's ten dollars an hour if they knitted it in mm -hmm. five hours you know and i'm like it probably took them more than five hours to knit that hat so yep. how much are they actually making hourly and then you're like then you feel bad for questioning them charging fifty dollars for a hat i don't know it's just I think it's hard in this time. Like people don't have enough money necessarily to be able to support the individuals that they want to. But I don't know. That is a very that's another whole podcast episode actually. <laughs> um, so that's I'm glad that we started to have that conversation because that could be a whole yeah. a whole 45 minutes. So Eric, are there a couple things that you can share with people listening to this podcast that they could use as guidelines or suggestions on moving things forward for themselves in their lives? Yeah, um, I mean, just thinking in terms of things we've been talking about, I guess, um, don't be afraid to reinvent yourself. So in the same way that I was kind of talking about um, learning something new to, to grow my art in a totally different direction, or even just doing a painting in a totally different way, um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about was um, like the kind of the growth. Um, I just think of it in terms of like, so when you look back at yourself and you see uh, how bad you were, don't, don't look back on that as, as a bad thing. Just see how much you've grown and, and letting that, that growth and that knowledge um, push you forward so you're always going to be learning and uh, just be aware that you're always going to be learning you're maybe never going to be at that place you you hope to be I think the hard thing as an artist is we're always holding ourselves up to these high standards of the masters and and we're always in this progress of growing and learning and so you look back at what you used to do and you're like oh my god I was so bad and so you know that 10 years from now you're going to look back at where you are now and be like oh my god I, I, had, I was so naive back then so it's just realize that it's always a process of growth and that not to compare yourself to other people because it's all just about the journey it's about the uh, you know the whole body of work not just that one piece that you made at that one point in time it's an evolution Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. So where can people find more about your, see your art, learn about your art, and learn about you? Yeah, I mean, just Google Eric Elliott. Um, my, my website is actually ElliottEric.com because they want me to pay way too much for EricElliott.com. Okay. So ElliottEric.com. And then also Eric Elliott Painting is my handle on uh, Instagram. My name is Ricky McGeckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast.